Thank you so much, and thank you so much for attending uh, this call. Uh, this is the first call in the series. And um, well, with, with us now we have uh, Gloria Macias Lizaso, who is the partner in McKinsey, in McKinsey, Spain, is the lead partner on data science, data analytics, well, all these things, I guess, that have anything to do with data, that is probably everything. Thank you so much for being with us. Yes, sure. We will ask, I will ask you ask you first uh, some questions and some questions about McKinsey. Uh, what is the McKinsey vision on data science? Uh, how do you see all this new boom that is starting and so on? Well, I think for us, um, and this is probably something that we are not the first ones to say, data is the new oil. And this is, and as oil basically serves for two th different things. One is it's going to be the engine that it's going to make the move uh, in every single organization. So data is going to transform the way that the organizations work and the way they respond to their customers, the way they, they organize their operations, the way they organize their supply chain, the way they organize their people, their employees. So it's it's going to be really the oil that it's going to be making all of this machinery working together in a much more efficient way. But also data is the new oil in the sense that oil is something that is very precious, that it's expensive. And Basically, you know, the data in the future, especially for those people that have proprietary data that has a significant value that provides insights into something, it's going to be something that will also be very precious and very expensive. Wonderful. And uh, I'm sure that you have a huge variety of clients from the ones that are very professional on big data to the ones that are static and so on. How do you approach uh, these clients? Uh, what type of things do you do and, and how do you uh, try to convey this idea of data as new oil to your clients? Do you have a generic approach or how do you do it? So we always focus on impact and on value. And I think a lot of people are thinking today about big data and about advanced analytics, but we find them that they are approaching them very much from almost like a theoretical perspective. Uh, let's do a model to explain this, but they have not thought about what is the value of explaining that. Even if you're able to explain it, what are the levers that you can act to take leverage of those insights? What is it that you are going to create in terms of impact? What other parts of the organization do you need to involve to get them on board, etc.? So we try to go much more, not only from the data analytics approach, but how are you going to create value out of this? And a lot of the discussions are about how do you prioritize? How do you know which use cases, which applications of data are going to create value versus which ones are simply, let me call them, intellectual exercises? We also talk to them about how are you going to make the change in the front line? There's a lot of understanding that needs to be done in the organizations to make sure that people start taking data-driven decisions. And there's a lot about change management that also needs to happen in there because you are telling people to trust a black box versus what they have always been doing. So there is a lot of co-creation co and understanding and democratizing of the data that needs to be done to get to the impact. So data is not only data. Now you have organizational change, you have mm. change into culture, you have so many things that go beyond uh, the data, the data itself. How do you see, you have to value this in the different sectors, in different areas. Uh, how do you see that in Europe and, and in Spain, uh, the different evolution of the sectors? Are all the same or we have sectors that are ahead and the others in this cultural mm. organizational change and use of data? Or what do you think? So I think banking, it's probably more advanced because of compliance reasons. So I think banking for, many, for, for, for the last few years, had been required by the regulator to store and compile and clean and have high data quality. So they are clearly ahead of the game in terms of collecting the data and having very good data repositories. I think there are some other companies like, for example, mm -hmm. manufacturing companies where, I mean, you could imagine they have a lot of data, but actually they are not storing any of these data. So you already see a difference there that is mainly driven by external forces, in this case, the regulator. 
I think then it's about, you know, how even if you have that data, how do you use it to take decisions? And I think there are some areas of the organization that are typically always more focused on that than others. For example, if you go to risk in any organization, typically it's much more prone on using data. If you go to things like pricing, it's it's across organizations they would be more 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 used to use data if you go to other things maybe like you know human resources typically they use much less advanced analytics although they could use them right so i think it, it depends by industry in terms of the data that they have but then across industries it depends on the functions mm. and what about industry now there is so much talk in europe about industry 4.0 and everything it's beyond 2.0 long ago it was 2.0 and now it has to be beyond 2.0 industry it's only four but i'm sure that they will evolve we will see a 5.0 one of those one of these days and um, what do you, how do you see that do you in spain and Europe, it's taking off or, or not or is so I think the potential is massive and I think many many of our clients are starting to think about this. I think they basically face uh, two, two, two key challenges. One is the data challenge in the sense that the data exists in the machines, for example, in the equipment that they are using in their in their factories or maybe the data exists but doesn't belong to them. For example, they have machinery that has sensors but this information is being fed back to the company that manufactured the machine. So the, the company that is using the machine cannot see that data from the sensors. So I think there is a big thing about data, who owns this data and how much of this data is being stored. And I think this is the first challenge that you know people are trying to, to, to tackle with. I think then the second challenge is Typically, these factories, these industries had been optimized through lean and the processes now work, I mean, like a Swiss clock, right? So they are extremely optimized and you need to change the mindset from people on how do you optimize the, the process versus how do you redesign the process? Mm -hmm. Because there's also a lot of things that could be automatized based on, on the insights of the data. And of course, this also gets a lot of resistance from, from many different people in, in, the, in, the, in the organizations. Yeah. Uh, before you have been talking about what you have uh, just elaborated, uh, these two lines in big data and data science, one is, well, here it's a data set, what can you find here and what type of insights can they use with, from this data set? And the other one, what you just mentioned, uh, we have a process and we have new tools, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you name them, that we can use to automatize this process and change it in a different way. These are kind of different lines. I mean, one type of people normally does one thing and then another time more sophisticated. How do you see this evolution in, in Europe and in Spain? Well, I think this, these two worlds should converge. I think we are very far from there. I think as, 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 as usual, you know, the, the, the theory goes much faster than the practice. But we are starting to see very interesting cases where they, you link the two of them. So there are cases where you could just do out, uh, robotics and you could say, you know, there is this process and I'm going to be, automatize most of it. And only the ones that create errors, I'm going to have human interventions. And you could take any process. I mean, typically approval processes, for example. If you do an analysis, you see that there are seven approval levels but 90% of the things actually get approved all throughout the line in the first instance. So there is no reason why this shouldn't be automatized. You don't need to use very advanced analytics to be able to take that decision. There are other cases where advanced analytics helps you up front. So you have complex processes, for example, let's say, you know, who is going to churn from your product or which um, equipment is going to fail or which equipment you should maintain. In those cases, having an advanced analytics algorithm allows you to discover, explore and discover what are the triggers, what are the alerts, what are the markets you should be looking for, and then you can put the automatization right after that. When these triggers happen, this is what you need to do in an automatic way to solve the problem. So. You could argue that you could do this. You could do artificial intelligence on its own, or you could do first advanced analytics and then link it to feed 
how artificial intelligence should react. Oh, wonderful. Uh, really nice. Uh, our students, for our students, McKinsey is the, <laughs> the leading the reference in terms of consulting firms. They look at you very much and, and so on. Uh, and uh, they are very interested in knowing, um, well, what do you ask them? What type of people do you hire? All these kind of things. I would like to ask you, what are you looking in a data science candidate and so on? I'm sure that many of our students would love uh, to work in, in your company. So I think we have two different types of, of profiles. Um, I think we, we've we been looking for the unicorn for a very long period of time. I think we have realized that it doesn't exist. So we typically look for two different types of profiles and, and they are very differentiated. What it's, one is the, the, the traditional, let me call it data scientists, which is not traditional at all because this is something that didn't exist just a couple of years ago. But there we're looking for someone that, you know, first of all, has experience leading with very, very, very large data sets and are, is able to solve problems when dealing with those large data sets. And typically there we're looking for experience in different type of contexts. For example, you know, do you have experience in, 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 in text or in visual recognition or in natural language processing? So different, let's say, dimensions within it. We understand that it's impossible that everybody has experience in everything. So we're trying to see what does this person brings that it's new to the team. Mm -hmm. And also that you have experience in at least two or three different programming languages so that you are easily client deployable depending on what it's the infrastructure that the client has. And then, of course, we are looking a lot of um, for people that has some business sense. So even if they do not know an industry in depth, they are able to understand what could be the implications of some type of problems or insights that we give to them. And then we have another role, which is a role of what we call the translators. So for our, these translators for us are very, very important because they are the ones that are able to guide the data scientist into what the model needs to do. And then and for us, basically the way we put it is, what the model will give you a very good answer to whatever question you ask. But it's very, very important that you ask the right question because if you don't ask the right question, the answer will not be any value. So these translators helps the data scientists to go through that. But also once the insight of the model comes, how this model can be implemented, what are the changes that you need to make in your processes to get, the, to get that value? So it's people that need to understand the business. And for us, these are our traditional consultants. We are taking some of the very good ones and we are training them on this because they had people that are highly analytical already. They are problem solvers. And they had been working for three, four, five years in a specific industry, so they know what drives value in that industry. And in our experience, when you put these two profiles together, that this translator, which is a traditional consultant, you know, on, um, upgraded to, to analytics, let me put it that way, and then you put the, the data sign, the result is very, very powerful. Oh, wonderful. Uh, one question that they wanted to ask you, but you more or less already answered is, uh, well, many of our students we are from a business school, they have a large, big business background. So probably they are never going to be this kind of geek that knows 20 <laughs> languages and so on. And then everybody is a little bit worried. Well, oh, well, I will never get there. It's uh, so complicated. I know how to do things in Python, in R, but come on, that's the all I know. Uh, do you think that they have? a uh, place, uh, maybe as translators, or maybe, what do you think? So definitely, I think, you know, you know, the translator position, which for me is critical, as I said, I think the tandem is what works best. One without the other cannot work. So you can, if the translator doesn't have a data scientist, he will not be able to get all the value out of the database. If the data scientist works without the translator, he could not be able to make models that then are uh, oriented to business impact, so I definitely think that is that that there is a there is a place for them and a, and, a, and a very big case. I think if they already know a little bit of Python or R, it's even better because they can they they can interact much better with the with the data scientists and this initial training that I was mentioning, it's already there, and it would be much easier for them to understand how the databases are structured, etc. But definitely, I do believe there is a space. Well, wonderful. Uh, there is another development that is happening in, in the field that are platforms. Now you have mm -hmm. Microsoft Azure, we have Amazon. 
AWS, uh, you have so many platforms, Google Cloud, and so on. And this kind of two parallel worlds. Uh, I mean, on one side, you have the Spark, Hadoop, and, and Cassandra, and all these uh, open source tools, and so on. And the other side, you have the proprietary. Do you see a value in knowing the platforms? Or do you think that we have to go this way too? Or what is your opinion on that? So I think, I mean, the way we approach it is, you know, we are platform agnostic in the sense that, you know, if the client already has a platform, we will work with that platform. If the client doesn't have a platform, we also have our own platform that where the clients can, can, can put the data and work for a period of time. But at any of these platforms, at the end of the day, we need to have people that know how to interact with them. So we, within our digital practice, we have what we call data engineers. And again, the same way that you cannot have data scientists that knows all of the pla- all of the programming languages, you cannot have data engineers that know all of the platforms. But you need to have at least some that know every single one of them. Because at the end of the day, you know, this is an environment in which you can work. And you need to understand how you are going to connect to that platform to be able to drive the impact. So I, I think, you know, understanding the concept of a platform is very important. Understanding a couple of them is very important because it basically helps you to structure your mind. And if you understand two, I would say you understand any of the others. Maybe you don't know how to use it, but at least you know how the different pieces fit. And it, by the way, it's impossible to know all of them, right? Wonderful. Uh, this is a moving field. Bef- before yeah. we didn't have platforms, now we have platforms. Now deep learning is coming and so on. Uh, what do you think? What is the next thing? I'm sure you know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know it. If I would know it, I would be investing on it. Um, I, I, I just think, you know, we are, we are seeing the tip of the iceberg. I mean, when, when you see what companies are using data for today and what they could be using data for, you know, the, 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 really the sky is the limit. And I think that we are probably seeing 0.1% of the potential that it's out there. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Uh, one last question. If you have to give an advice, only one single advice to your students, what would it be? For me, it would be keep learning, be curious. You know, it's. I think we are in a in a society. We are in a in a time that you can never stop learning. So that would be for me the best advice. Well, thank you so much, and thank you so much for being with us. And we are so happy to have McKinsey as our first interview. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. Take care. <laughs> thank you.